All right, hello everyone. My name is Jeffrey Bigham. I'm from the University of Washington Computer Science and Engineering Department. Um, and today, uh, the work I'm going to be presenting, um, Web Anywhere Screen Reader on the Go. This is work in collaboration with my advisor, Richard Ladner, and um, also Craig Prince, Anna Cavender, Jeremy Brudvik, and many others in the, the uh, computer science department. And so at the University of Washington, I'm part of a group called Web Insight. And the goal of the Web Insight project is to um, learn about the accessibility problems that mostly blind people face on the web and then discover and develop solutions for improving access. And so um, blind, blind uh, web users uh, face a number of challenges when they're accessing the web. And so I'm just going to say a few commonly mentioned ones. Uh, first, you know, images that lack appropriate alternative text. Um, they may, may miss out on information contained in those. Um, they may have to deal with complex web pages that weren't designed for efficient access with a screen reader. Um, and they also may have to deal with interfaces that were developed um, primarily for use with a mouse. And while all of these are problems and all of these are things that we in the Web Insight group are working on, today I'm going to be talking about a totally different access problem. And this all stems from the fact that people are increasingly using the web um, to access information when they're not at their own computers. So you may go to a library and access your email. You may check the bus schedule from the gym so you know when to run outside and get your bus. Or you may, when visiting a friend, check in for your flight using their laptop. The problem with this when it comes to screen reader users is that to use a computer, screen reader, a screen reader user must have a screen reader. And that screen reader costs about $1,000. And so what I'm going to talk about today is a web application that we've developed um, called Web Anywhere that enables access to the web um, by just visiting a web page. And um, I think uh, while the majority of my talk is going to be about this, about this uh, web application screen reader, um, I think the general theme I'd like to get across is that there's a lot of problems that are inherent for accessibility um, in technology associated with Web 2.0. However, what we try to do in the Web Insight project is use these same technologies to actually improve things. And so, um, what I'd like to start with is um, just some very basic background material on um, how a screen reader works and um, what sort of accessibility issues are inherent in new technology that's coming out. So this is just a screenshot of the University of Washington homepage. And I'm going to play a sound of what this sounds like uh, using a screen reader. 35 links run table. CSE logo, University of Washington, Computer Science, Engineering, Link, about this link, Search, Link, Contact Info, Link, University of Washington, Link, College of Engineering, Link, College of Arts and Sciences, Table 1, Star, 3 rows, 5 columns, Topics, Link, News, Link, Events and Talks, Link, Education, Link, Research, Link, People, Link, Diversity, Link, Organizations, Link, Computing, Facility, Graphic. Okay, so, <laughs> I see some very interesting expressions. Um, <laughs> okay, so in that, those about 30 seconds, um, we got from... I hope I don't move out of the camera here, but we got from the top of the page here, along the top portion, along these links, and then down to about here. And so if you're a screen reader user, um, this page has been compressed into a linear form. And so up to this point, you know nothing about all this other information. Whereas a visual user, user just looking at this page, gets some sort of um, summary, even if they're not really paying attention with, to the other information um, that's, that's displayed here. And I just want to mention, I think I'm already doing better because last time I played the screen reader, um, actually in this exact auditorium, I think three doors shut simultaneously. <laughs> um, so that's what a screen reader does, and that's what we're trying to um, work with here. Okay. And so um, just to reiterate, um, so this Web 2.0 technology, I think, is pre presents both a challenge and a promise for accessibility. And some of the challenges, which I'm going to discuss here in the next slides, are dynamic changes. So how do you convey dynamic changes made to a web page to something where the context is very limited to what it's reading at, that, at a given moment? Um, also, um, many interfaces are actually inaccessible using a screen reader, like I mentioned before, with a mouse. Um, but Web 2.0 can improve accessibility by helping us to understand accessibility and helping us to overcome accessibility challenges. And that's what I'm really going to talk about. Um, our group doing today. Um, so here is Gmail. Um, you're probably familiar with this. Um, this is an email that I got about a book I have due to the UW library. Um, if I'm looking at this, if I'm reading this with a screen reader, and assuming somehow I got to the, um, the main part of the message, 
you know, maybe it looks something more like this, where all, all I see you know, in my current context is the material listed will be due soon, overdue. But what I didn't, really, what I didn't realize is that while I was re listening to that, I got a chat message, in this case from myself, my, my best friend. And um, the reason I didn't realize that is because the screen reader has a limited context, and it can't um, alert me, automatically anyway, that um, something has changed in the page. And so you might say, oh, well, just what the solution to this is, is just alert somebody when something's changed in the page. And so I want to bring up another example. This is Google Finance, which I really like this page. It has all of these fun numbers, and it updates almost constantly, so you can get um, the almost up-to-date view of all of these, this financial information. But if we do the same thing, so you know, maybe my context here is this. This is what, what's being uh, spoken to me at the given moment. Um, then it turns out that pretty much the whole rest of the page has changed while I was listening to that. You wouldn't want to be, want to be alerted to all of these different things changing at the same time. So if I go back, you can kind of see <laughs> some things changed. OK. And then as a final example, um, this is a uh, storefront for um, Wolf Camera. And this is a, an online retailer of all sorts of different electronic devices, including cameras. Um, so say I'm interested in um, Xbox 360 games. I can choose electronics, go down to video game, go down to Xbox, and go down to Xbox 360 games. You may argue whether or not this is really a, a great interface for this. Um, but the point here is that all of these things are only accessible if you use the mouse. So the only way this, this uh, drop-down menu works is by clicking on each one of these individual item, items. And so if you're using a screen reader, you're unlikely to be using a mouse. And so this interface is actually unlikely to be accessible to you. And so instead, you're presented by, by the screen reader something that looks more like this. And so you know, I wouldn't want to um, have to go through these 30 or 40 links to find what I want. And not to mention the you know, 300 or something that are actually contained in that menu. And so this is just one more example of the inefficient access that um, you may have to put up with if you're using a screen reader. OK, so that was kind of a whirlwind tour of some of the problems um, that uh, Web 2.0 can present to screen reader users. And now I'm going to show the first example of how we can use that same technology to um, get a better, first, a better sense of what the problems are. And so this, I'm going to present a blind and sighted browsing comparison. And then I'll go on to talking about um, what the meat of the talk is, and that is the Web Anywhere um, screen reader on the go. On the go. Okay. So we conducted a study which we called Web In Situ. And we called it that. Um, the in situ part basically means we're observe, observing our participants in their natural environment. And their natural environment here means using their own equipment, their own assistive technology, browsers, uh, screen readers, et cetera. What we were really interested in was observing access accessibility from the user perspective. And so in this case, um, that's really important. As you can see from our graph over here, this is um, domain popularity of the pages that were visited by our participants in this study. This is over a period of a week. They viewed about 21,000 different web pages. And what's interesting here is you know, Google tops the list at um, somewhere around, I think around 4,000 or so of, of the pages that people visited. And what's important about this from an accessibility um, standpoint is that this means that Google all of a sudden means a lot more. You're, a lot of the accessibility that you experience on the web is actually dependent a lot more on Google than on some of these other sites. And if you take the top three, which just happen to be Google, MSN, and Yahoo, um, that they share about one third of all the visits um, from our, our user group, which means that really they're, they're responsible for one third of the accessibility that you actually experience on the web. And so that's why we really, we, we really wanted to view this from the user perspective and why we treated all pages um, equally that our um, visitors or our participants viewed. And so, to enable that, we used a proxy-based system that users, um, it was based on a product by Richard Adderer et al. called Use a Proxy. And the idea with this system is users connect to a, a web proxy, and when pages are retrieved through that web proxy, uh, JavaScript is added to the page that allows us to um, observe actions and things that you couldn't uh, observe with a usual web proxy. Um, and so this might sounds similar to, say, Google Analytics, which, but in this case, we don't have access to the actual pages themselves from the start. And so we use the proxy to insert the JavaScript as opposed to just inserting it ourselves. Okay. 
So some of the observations we had, um, in terms of efficiency, um, it's, it's pretty well understood that it's less efficient to access the web using a screen reader. One of the things we found overall, um, blind users spend about twice as long per page um, as compared to their sighted counterparts. We were able to isolate um, several um, specific tasks that all of our users did. And one of those was surprisingly, or not surprisingly, um, searching Google. And so we had two subtasks in there. The one is arriving at the Google homepage, issuing or entering a query, and then hitting the, the uh, submit button or hitting enter. enter. And we found that for that subtask, um, blind users actually took about twice as long as their sighted counterparts to do this. Um, for the second, on Google, was once the results page came up, um, to actually find a result and click on it, our, sighted, our blind users took about five times longer than our sighted, their sighted counterparts to find the, the result that they are interested in and click on it. So that just gives you an, a, some, sort, a, some sense of the efficiency difference in um, blind versus sighted uh, web browsing. We were also interested to see what kind of effects um, the accessibility of the pages themselves had on uh, what our participants did. And so images being one of the standard examples of, of uh, inaccessibility, uh, they, so we, we, we were really interested in images um, that lacked alternative text. And we found that um, images that lacked appropriate alternative text, that is alternative text that appropriately described what the image was about, um, were three times less likely to be um, clicked on by our blind participants as compared to our sighted participants. And so now the accessibility of the page is really influencing behavior as opposed to just making it harder or um, less efficient for users to browse the web. Um, we also found we were, we were interested in, um, in terms of Web 2.0, style technology, we're interested in dynamic updates to the page. And so we looked at uh, dynamic changes to the page. And for our definition, what we meant was any content that was added to the page with scripting after the page had loaded. And so we looked at how many times our various, our two user groups, blind and sighted, uh, interacted with this content. And so we found that our blind users interacted with 20 times fewer of these things that were, they were added. Um, to the page after the page had loaded than, our, than their sighted counterparts. So again, they're not either able to f see that this stuff has, had happened or they're just avoiding it. Um, our, our blind users visited, visited seven times fewer pages that used Ajax technology. So again, they're avoiding technology or pages that use um, this technology, which isn't necessarily inaccessible, but definitely indicates that it could be a page that's in inaccessible. And surprisingly, though, we, we observed no difference um, with how many of the pages that our users uh, visited that contained Flash content. And so we were kind of surprised by that, so we looked a little deeper and we found that about half of the Flash uh, content that they viewed was, happened to be ads. And so it probably didn't really matter that, uh, to them, so it didn't really affect the experience. And many of them actually played sound, which can you know, be just as easily uh, experienced with the screen reader and without. And um, few of the flash, uh, few of the flash content objects were actually vital. Um, most of them just were supplementary to the main content of the page, or they provided like visual effects, things like that. So again, whirlwind tour of Web 2.0 and some of its effects on accessibility. And so now I'd like to get to the main part of this talk, which is um, the screen reader on the go. And I'm going to start by motivating why we need a web application that um, works as a screen reader. OK, so, but I'm going back to Web 2.0. So the advantages of Web 2.0 application, applications are many. Um, first, ubiquitous access. Um, Craig was talking at lunch how he was traveling a few months ago. And it was great to have Gmail, because no matter where he was, as long as there was a computer with internet access, Gmail was there. Um, and so this is the same with many of these applications. Um, I have here screenshots of Gmail, and I also have one of Google Documents. And so while well, I don't think many would argue that these web applications provide the same level of user experience as, say, like Microsoft Office or some of these other traditional alternatives, um, they're very valuable. And I use them myself just because I can access them from anywhere in any computer that I happen to be at. 
Um, and you know, they're great for the developers, too, because they have this lightweight client UI um, and this, the more um, heavy-duty server-side components that make it easier to release and update, and this, the um, development cycle becomes a lot faster. Um, and so the problem here is that blind users may miss out. First of all, there's the accessibility problems that I talked about, I just talked about. But then there, there's also the problem that to use these web applications, you need a $1,000 screen reader to be installed on any computer that you're going to visit. And so that's probably not true with the various places that you can access um, the web when you're traveling or when you're, you're going about town. Um, and so who are uh, these, these blind computer users? And well, they're actually a sizable population. And so there's about 10 million visually impaired people in the United States, about 1.3 million blind people in the United States. And if you're wondering what these particular pictures are, um, this is from an event that we went to about two weeks ago. Um, I don't know, about half the people in the front row and myself. Uh, and this was an event we were, where we were teaching blind high schoolers to program computers. And so um, I, think, I think it helps to put a really a personal perspective on who, who this really um, affects, this accessibility really affects. And um, it, it definitely taught us a lot about how screen readers are used and um, the types of things that people want to be able to do. Um, and one of those things that people want to be able to do is, say, this Benetech Bookshare um, website. And so this is a great service. Uh, it provides free access to about 34,000 books to anyone who they call is uh, print disabled. And that means that anyone who has trouble reading a traditionally printed book. The problem with this website is that, again, it requires this $1,000 screen reader to access all of this free content. Because while this is on the web, the screen reader itself is quite costly and uh, definitely not free like, like these books are. And so some other things you might do, um, just to drive this point home, uh, and I'm sure this being Google, you've probably thought of many more. Um, but you can check, the email, check your email at the gym, make restaurant reservations, check when your bus is coming, maybe settle an argument with a friend or see who won the game, and many, many, many more. And where can you do this? Well, you can do it at the public library. A lot of them have public terminals. You can do it at internet cafes, which are, exist in pretty much all major cities. Um, at the airports, often have, they have, often have public terminals. Or you can do it from a friend's laptop. And so while there are many options, um, if you're trying to access these many options, um, as a screen reader user, you really have to consider it slightly different. You have, to have a, you have to find a public terminal with a screen reader. You, maybe you could use a smartphone, but again, it needs a screen reader. Um, maybe a PDA with some sort of access, screen reader, refreshable braille display, um, and maybe with the phone. So um, I know people here are working on uh, Google 411, and that's another way of limited access to the web. And there's many, so there's many trade-offs with these various options that I'm going to explore in the next couple slides. Um, some that come immediately to mind are cost, availability, and then the functionality of the device that you're using. And so to put all this in perspective, I uh, went on Dell.com yesterday, and I looked to see what kind of computer I could buy for the least amount of money. <laughs> and so I went through the whole process here, and I found that I could actually get a computer for about $350. And this is without a monitor, so maybe you add a cheap CRT monitor for like 25 bucks, say 50 bucks, and you get up to about $375, $400. And I like to point out that this, lab, this computer, while it is the cheapest that Dell offers, new, um, it's actually much more powerful than this laptop that I, I use every day and um, am presenting with right now. And so to explore this further, I like to place some of the um, various alternatives to uh, a traditional screen reader or for screen reading on, this, on these two axes. And so basically there's, uh, the x axis here is from low cost to high cost. And the uh, y-axis is low availability to high availability. So the first thing we have here is just our traditional screen readers, which are about $1,000. And so they have low availability because they're unlikely to be installed on most machines you come across. And the licenses prevent you from installing them on multiple computers. Um, they have fairly high cost with $1,000. Um, and so they get placed down there in the lower right. Um, System Access Mobile is a screen reader on a USB key. 
And so what this USB key basically has is an executable that you can then plug, you can plug this key into a computer you come across, run that executable, and then you have a limited screen reader that can allow you to do most things, including surf the web. And so that costs $400. And so that gets a that's a little bit more highly available. It doesn't get maximally highly available because as you th if you think about it, it's not, it doesn't seem likely that most public terminals are gonna allow you to run arbitrary executables on their on the machines. Um, but if you go to a friend's laptop or something like that, you can probably use this USB key. And so again, it's, it's not the cheapest thing at $400, but it's not, it's not that bad of an option. Um, so a smartphone with mobile speak pocket, um, this is pretty pricey at about five or $600 for the phone itself, and then another five or $600 for the um, mobile seek pocket, which is basically a version of a screen reader that runs on smartphones like this. And so I'll put that um, very highly available and slightly more, more costly. And it's, it's important to note that um, it's unlikely that someone would use um, just the smartphone or just the system access mobile. They're probably buying this on top of the, the initial $1,000 screen reader that uh, goes on their primary computer. Um, and so another option that a lot of people um, have is a Braille note taker, which has um, a refreshable Braille uh, display along the bottom. And that um, it basically acts as a laptop or a PDA and also has this uh, Braille output. And it can also double as an input device um, for your primary computer. Um, again, very high cost. And it has fairly good availability, though, because it can access uh, wireless um, systems. And, th and the thing that I'm, I'm purposely leaving out of this, of course, is um, you could have a laptop yourself. Um, I personally don't carry my laptop everywhere I go. And uh, I'd be afraid to. I'd, I, I think I, I've broken this thing more times than I like to count. Um, but the idea is more that you want to access the um, computers that are available to everybody else. Okay. And then um, as, a final, as a final alternative here, I have Firefox, which is a Firefox extension that acts as a screen reader just for Firefox. Um, and I put that at kind of lower availability, although very low cost. And the reason for that is that, first of all, you have to have Firefox. You have to be, have permission to install things on the machine, although perhaps less permission than you would have to to run an arbitrary executable. And um, this would allow you, again, to uh, browse the web using a screen reader. And so what we really want, and what, I, what you've probably guessed that I'm setting up here, is something that goes up in that uh, upper left-hand corner, which is high availability and low cost. And so that's where we're hoping that this Web Anywhere product that we've created can fit. Somewhere up there where it's almost free because it's a web application and it's highly available from any machine that has a web browser um, and uh, from anywhere that has internet access. And of course, there's some other free alternatives that have slightly different functionality. Um, so the National Association of the Blind in India actually has their site completely accessible without a screen reader based on a flash object. And so you can navigate their entire site using this flash object um, even if you didn't have a screen reader. Of course, it only works on their site. Um, but at least that gives people the option to access their site without a screen reader. And then Google 411, um, obviously a very different type style, but it's still kind of the idea of accessing the web from anywhere, in this, in this case, just using any cell phone that you ha happen to have. And the information is, is limited to what is provided, but um, still, some, still along these lines, you could imagine uh, implementing something like a screen reader in, in a phone like that. Okay. And so what are the barriers to ubiquitous access? Um, well, screen readers are required on each machine, screen readers are expensive, and mobile devices are even more expensive. So the important question to ask then is why are screen readers so expensive? Um, we just showed that uh, they are actually much more expensive than, say, an entire computer with Windows loaded on it. And the reason is basically there's a small market, and these applications need to be incredibly complex to deal with um, the diversity of applications that exist. There's not a single API, there's not a single way that text is represented on the screen or that interaction is actually written by programmers. And so they have to go in and figure out how all of these things work and basically shoehorn them into something that fits with the screen reader's model of how things should work. 
And so all that effort combined with the low market is what leads to these screen readers being so expensive. And so that expense means that um, before I talked about the US um, blind population, and now I'm going to talk about the world blind population, which is about 20 million strong. Um, and so the vast majority can't afford screen readers. In fact, less than 1% of blind people throughout the world actually have a screen reader. Um, just an interesting um, fact, uh, one out of three blind people actually live in India. And um, I've been told that they estimate, the National Association of Blind in India estimates that only between 1,000 to 2,000 people in India actually have a screen reader like JAWS or Window Eyes installed on the machine. And many of these, if not most of these, are actually cracked versions. And so we really want to solve this fundamental problem. There's so much information, so much benefit to accessing the web. You know, we need to do something about this difference in price. $375 new computer and a $1,000 screen reader. It just doesn't work out for it. The, the economics just don't work out, even in the United States, let alone countries where these things might not be um, as available anyway. OK, so what we wanted to create with all of this background was a screen reading web application. And there's a lot of benefits to doing this that make it easier than uh, creating the screen readers, the general purpose screen readers that I mentioned before. First is you really only have one API to support. So ignoring problems with getting it to work on the three or four major web browsers, really all you have to do is, if, is create something that can uh, interpret and um, deal with the DOM of a web page. And once you've done that, then you've already created most of what you need to access the web um, from a web application. And what's great about it is it's for affordable. It's almost free. And it can be accessible from you know, any operating system browser and anywhere that a computer can play sound. Um, and more than just uh, one group benefits. The first, blind users on the go, as we talked about. The second, blind users who are unable, otherwise unable to afford a screen reader. And third, web developers who don't want to pay $1,000 for a screen reader, but yet want the ability to check their web pages for accessibility with a screen reader, which has been shown to be one of the most effective ways to actually ensure that your web page is accessible. Okay. So now I'm going to actually talk, after all of that introduction, I'm going to talk about the actual thing that we created, which is Web Anywhere. So Web Anywhere, web application, where the interface is local. It's created in JavaScript. Um, speech is created remotely and then played back locally. And that's a summary of the system. So I have a screenshot here. And I'm going to do what you should never do. And that is give a demo live to an audience. <laughs> OK. So if I, switch, if I switch to Firefox here, I'm going to reload this so everything might work. OK, so what, it, what I did here, I, I loaded the web application, the Web Anywhere web application, and it started speaking to you. And what it did is it basically is just telling a first time user or anyone who's forgotten the instructions for using the system. And what's great is without using the mouse, um, I can. I can go to the um, location bar here. It's basically like a little mini browser inside the larger browser. Um, and so I can type any URL that I want to now visit. So say I want to go to Google. You notice as I type it, it's actually playing the letters that I type. And all of this, again, remember that all this speech is actually being generated remotely on a server at the University of Washington and brought back here. And so I, I type that. So I know, I know what I'm typing. I can also review what I've, what I've typed. Make sure I typed it correctly. So I go to Google.com. So is anybody surprised by anything? So yeah, it's, it's, it's actually, if you click this More button, there's a lot of links down there. And so even though they're invisible to the um, it's a visual, a visual uh, browser, it's, it still picks them up. Um, and so the thing that, that you might be surprised about is that Google and the screen reader here 
Um, because this is a web application, this top frame, um, this top frame is actually located at, at, on a server um, at, from the University of Washington, whereas Google.com here appears to be located on Google.com. And so they shouldn't be able to talk to each other. So the JavaScript on the top frame shouldn't be able to talk to the, um, the lower Google.com frame. And so what we've done is just made it appear to the browser that Google.com has, has been retrieved from our server as opposed, the same server as the top frame, as opposed to Google.com itself. And so these, this brings up some interesting security issues um, with cross-site scripting and such that I'll, I'll address in a bit. I just wanted to head that off in case anyone was, was wondering about that. <laughs> All right, and so, um, so the screen reader provides much of the functionality that a normal screen reader provides. So I can tab around. And it'll, it'll, it'll keep track. I can also um, jump forward. So because we've been reduced to this linear interface or linear uh, view of the web, one of the major things that screen readers provide for web browsing is the ability to skip forward in content. And so if I, if I hit a control key, I can jump right to the first form element. And it said Google search. I can now type in my. Uh, what? So I'll look for Web Insight, which is our project name. And so I can find the submit button, and then I can search. And so it'll, it'll proceed reading this page. I can also, because Google implements or adds headings to the search results, I can actually skip ahead and go to the result that I obviously want, which is our, our web page. And I can load that, and it'll read that. So it basically, it's just performing um, the normal functions of a screen, reader, a screen reader, but it's all based entirely on the web. And so you can access this from any computer that you, um, you happen to be visiting. And so you know, I can choose to go somewhere else. Um, it works pretty well. Zero items, 367 links. Okay. So this is this has a lot of links. Have you heard 367? And there's no headings. Um, I'm sure there's ways to skip around with a normal screen reader, although you know, I can skip around with the tab key. So this is all actually running from my cache too. Um, I'll, I'll warn you. <laughs> I didn't want to risk a, a live, totally live thing, but um, you know so. So uh, I hope you're convinced that you know, it actually works. You can actually, from a web application, a web page that you visited, you can get all the speech, all the screen reading functionality you need to browse um, most web pages. OK. So return to my, my slides here. OK. And so like, as, I, as I kind of explained as I was going along, there's this Web Anywhere frame. This is where the, all the JavaScript, all the um, sound players, and all that stuff live. And then there's this content frame, which um, actually loads the content that the scripts in the top frame read to the user. Um, if you go to a new page, um, I'm, it looks like I'm at Google.com, but actually it's at this complicated thing that looks like that makes the browser think it's at the same address as the top frame. Okay, so the architecture looks something like this. Um, on the server side. Um, we have a reverse proxy, which does that thing that makes it look like Google.com is actually existing on um, our server. And that's just with the Apache web server configured as a reverse proxy. Um, the page gets sent off, off to the client side, um, where the Web Anywhere script is able to see it, interact with the transform page, decide what sounds it wants um, the, uh, the uh, what sounds it needs to play to, to represent the page and the interaction. And then it sends those requests back to the server where um, the text-to-speech is performed. And then it comes back to the client side where um, the, embedded, the either embedded sound player or flash player actually plays those sounds. So the speech is generated using the um, Freeware Festival text-to-speech program. And it's then encoded into MP3 using a lame encoder. Um, we keep a cache of speech sounds. Um, obviously, th some things get repeated a lot, uh, like link, web insight, 
Uh, that gets repeated a lot in my browsing history. And, and just in general, things like link, title, image, things like that that are part of the interaction get repeated a lot. And then people tend to visit the same pages. And so by having a cache, we can improve um, performance. Um, playback is either via Flash, via this uh, Flash object called Sound Manager 2, which is really just a JavaScript wrapper around a Flash object that plays sounds. Um, and then we've done some prototype systems with embedded system or embedded players that use like QuickTime or the uh, Windows Media Player to play sounds. And uh, and also we have a Java uh, sound sound player. Um, the sound, the length of the sound. If you think about um, as I'm reading along this page. I could choose to send either I could send I could choose to produce sounds for a variety of lengths of um, the web page. So one approach you might think would be the simplest was would be to send the entire web page off and um, produce what the sound would be for that entire web page. And then back on the client side, just choose where in that sound file to start playing based on what the, the user has done. Um, it turns out that it's a better balance for uh, latency and also the natural soundingness of the speech. I know it didn't sound that natural, but uh, it could be a lot worse. If we generate them for logical sections of the text, and so in this case, um, each DOM node um, at a certain level gets a uh, sound generated for it. And so there's some examples there at the bottom. Um, and so most sounds end up being about two to five seconds long and about uh, less than 10, 10K. And so the examples here, so if we have a heading, H1, Web Insight, uh, we send the string heading one web insight, um, and then analogous things for the uh, images and anchor examples there. And so because the speech is generated on a remote server, um, one of the major concerns here is the latency of determining what to send and then sending it and getting our response back. And that does end up being the major concern for latency for the system. Um, and so what, we, what we've been experimenting with is um, to use prefetching of DOM elements that we think are uh, likely to occur next um, in the, the user's browsing and um, send those off to the server ahead of time. And so while the user is listening to um, a certain a sound that was previously retrieved, we can be fetching a new one. And so we just use AJAX requests to essentially prime the cache um, and currently, we're just doing this in a very simple way with a DFS search of the DOM um, tree, or DFS order of the DOM um, uh, elements. We're sending those off in that order to the server for prefetching. Um, and we found that even this simple approach works pretty well. Um, initially, the latency is about 20 milliseconds to 8, 80, or 800 milliseconds, 200 milliseconds to 800 milliseconds on average. And that prefetching actually improves this by about 20%. There's obviously some opportunity for smarter prefetching. So if you know that the user is going to be tabbing around a lot, or if they have been doing that in the past, then you might actually, instead of DFS order through the DOM, you might want to fetch things in tab order or some other order that you've determined. Okay. And so there's a number of remaining issues, though. My demo actually went off pretty well, and so I, I'm, I'm happy about that. But there are some remaining issues. Um, the first is losing focus. Because this is a web application, the only thing that speaks is that web application. And so, and the only thing that can gather input is that web application. And so if a pop-up happens um, and it removes focus from the web, the web Anywhere web application, then all of a sudden you can't produce uh, speech and you can't gather the um, uh, keyboard input of the user. And so we aggressively block pop-ups. We also aggressively block the um, redirection of web pages away from our reverse proxy, which would cause um, errors in the JavaScript in terms of like uh, cro basically cross-site scripting errors. Um, we also restrict the keyboard um, as much as possible so that control keys that would remove focus from the web browser um, are caught and suppressed. And the problem is we can't um, control all keys, so the operating system doesn't like it when you um, try to capture you know Alt Tab or Control Alt Delete things like that. And uh, and there's still all the, the security concern of avoiding of how avoiding cross-site scripting isn't always good. <laughs> and so um, the, and then from the user perspective, there's a remaining issue of how you actually get to Web Anywhere in the first place. Um, because to use the system, you actually have to get to that web page. And so some, I think, reasonable proposals are 
you know, if you're at a library, maybe there's a friendly librarian. She looks pretty friendly, although that's just a random picture from Google Images. <laughs> I think she would help you. And um, there is some built-in OS functionality. Even you know, XP has some limited uh, screen reading functionality, and Vista it's even better, and uh, the Mac has, has some uh, reasonable um, screen reading functionality that would allow you to get to a web page. You probably wouldn't want to use it um, to actually browse the web or to use another application, but um, it, all you have to do is get there, so it help you bootstrap into the system. And then you can just get help from others. Um, pretty much anywhere there's a public terminal, there's probably somebody there that, if nothing else, wants to take your money for use of that public terminal, and so you could probably get them to help you. Um, we did a preliminary user study. We had th three blind web users, um, one female and two um, remotely located. And a fun part about two of them being remotely located was that if you've ever tried to, use a, a, tried to um, test a prototype screen reading system with someone who is already using a screen reader, it's very confusing because there's a lot of things talking at the same time. <laughs> um, and so the task, we had a very simple task. Um, we had them all do a Google search and some unstructured web browsing. Um, they were all able to do these tasks just fine. Um, they occasionally lost focus. Um, that's the problem with the pop-ups. Um, that occasionally happened with, during the unstructured browsing. But they were all able to get back with some minimal coaching, um, just reminding them to you know, hit Alt-Tab until they got back to the browser window. And, it, and to help control that, the, the uh, Web Anywhere system actually, if it loses focus and then gains it again, it'll announce itself the next time that uh, it gains focus. So you know, oh, I Alt-Tabbed, you know, and it's back. OK, and so the comments were, were interesting. First of all, we had no feedback about latency being bad. So we were really concerned that, because the speech is being generated remotely, that latency would be a major concern. And they didn't actually experience that. And I think that's because, in general, the latency is actually really low. Um, the connections are pretty fast, and the sound fires are very small. Um, most of them were actually really excited, and what they really wanted was just more features. They wanted it to act more like their um, desktop screen reader. Um, and obviously, you know, you haven't put everything, all the features that um, the desktop speech screen reader has in it in there yet. Although there's no, that's really an engineering problem. It's not um, a. Uh, there's no reason we can't do that. And um, they wanted. They also wanted the ability to customize to their preferences. So some of them used um, jaw, the Jaws screen reader. Some of them used the Window Eyes screen reader. And they wanted the keyboard commands to be the same um, with the system as with uh, the ones they're used to. Okay. And in terms of future work, really, you know, we want to follow our users' feedback. We want to implement more features. We want to make it more robust, um, improve protections against losing focus. And then with secure sites, we want to enable access to secure sites. And we want to at least maintain the browser protections. We have some ideas about how to do that. Um, and we're hoping that, uh, hoping that, that those will work out. And then once that's done, uh, we want to really want to re release this and uh, get, it out, get it out there so people can use it. So in conclusion, uh, the screen, re screen reader users are limited by cost and availability of assistive technology. Um, Web 2.0 provides this challenge in both opportunity, and one of the things that we think can be an opportunity is this Web Anywhere screen reader, which um, provides a screen reading web application and is a low-cost alternative to screen readers for both blind users on the go and also people that may not be able to otherwise for, uh, forward a screen reader. Okay, and so with that, I'm done, and I invite you to visit our website and talk to me and ask questions and all that good stuff. <laughs> yeah. So what are some of the thoughts that you have about the securing, <laughs> I mean, securing the fact that you're every, everything is now on a single domain? So the one thing that we could do, I mean, I thought about this a little bit. Um, I think that if you could actually embed the, um, embed the, uh, the screen reading script into the page itself as it came through and maintain the same, and basically fool the browser into thinking that they are separate domains, then that would provide some of that protection. How exactly that works from the engineering side, I'm not. I haven't quite figured that out yet, but I think that's really what you'd have to end up doing. So is this available now for anyone to use? 
it's not quite yet available for anyone to use. Um, there's a couple reasons for that. <laughs> the one is um, basically if, if we release it, it's an open proxy out into the world. <laughs> um, so we have to do something about that. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> Maybe Google would. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, no, that's the that's major reason. So the first thing we need to do is somehow restrict this, the flow um, of traffic through. And then also there's some, you know, we'd like to improve it a little bit before, before users, users try it out. Well, I know as a web developer, I would use this. And so if there were some way that you could package it up and provide it to Google to run internally for Google, to use. Mm -hmm. I imagine that might be the thing that we would want. Yeah, that's, uh, I mean, I would love to have the opportunity to, you know, actually, yeah, try it out in a limited environment like that before releasing it right. off to the world. Yeah, right. right. So, yeah, we should, talk, we should talk about that. Sure. Anything else? All right. Well, thanks everyone for coming.